Hi, I'm Kenny Eats. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. Today we're going to finish up our three-part series entitled, Show Me the Way. Today's message is entitled, Light of the World. Jesus said that we are both the salt of the earth, which we covered in our last two messages in the series, but he said that we're also the light of the world. We're to be the light to the world. In short, we're to be salt to the body of Christ, but to the world, we're to let our light shine because Jesus has made us light. He has made us to be light to the world. Therefore, we're not to join the darkness of this world. We're not to help them promote the darkness of this world, but rather we're to bring light to this world. So turn with me, please, to our scripture reading, which is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Therefore, that is who we are, who we Christians are to an unbelieving and unsaved world. The world is in darkness because it does not have nor does it believe in the light that brings life. And that light is Jesus Christ. For without light, there is no life. How can we guide the world out of darkness when our churches are back in the darkness? Our Christian politicians are throwing their hand in with the darkness. The same darkness that the book of Revelation said would come upon the whole world in the end times. They shamelessly get up and lie to their constituents that their hands are tied and that there is nothing that they're able to do. Yet they keep silent uh, about known fraud that's going on. They keep silent about the deception and blatant corruption. They have nothing to say about those things. They attack the very ones who are actually trying to do good for our country. Shame, shame. What a shame they are to the body of Christ. No wonder the Lord Jesus said that he would spit the last day church out of his mouth. For they leave a nasty, dirty taste in our mouth. How much more in the mouth of a holy and just God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. But we are not walking as children of light. Instead of chasing after souls, we're chasing after things. Instead of spending our energies and ministering to the lost, the church is chasing wealth. They're chasing popularity and the things that unbelievers chase after. Some Christians are so caught up in race and caught up in culture that they put that first instead of putting Jesus first. Jesus, the one who died for them, the one who died for the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. We have the white church. We have the black church. We have the Spanish church. We have all sorts of denomination that build up walls and keep us separated with doctrines and different beliefs. And we are the church. We are one church. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, since there is one bread, we believers who are many are united into one body. 
For we all partake of the one bread which represents the body of Christ. It's the amplified version that we we're reading from. Yet, we Christians let race, we let culture, we let politics separate us to the point that we're actually begin to do the work of darkness. We receive just as much criticism from Christians as from the world until sometimes it borders on hate. Instead of actually reading scripture for themselves, some in the church will defend tooth and nail some erroneous regurgitated dogma that they have been taught all their lives and even when confronted with the truth, they still hold fast to the lies that was taught them. Other Christians are offended when a pastor speaks of tithes and offerings, yet they expect to be spiritually fed and to have programs and ministering to the poor and needy, and yet they do nothing to lend a helping hand, not even pray. And, and that is free. That's something that's free. Prayer costs you nothing but time. David Brennard was a Presbyterian minister, a missionary to the Native Americans in Delaware and New Jersey. He lamented while on his dying bed that he was unable to work. He was unable to do something physically for the Lord. He was so tired, so weak from his sickness that he couldn't even pray. And he lamented that he could do nothing, not even pray. And because of the sickness caused from tuberculosis, he couldn't even get out of his bed. He felt it was a waste of his life not to do something, not to be busy about the Father's work, not to be doing something for the kingdom of God. While we Christians today can hardly make it out to a church service on the Lord's day, how lukewarm have we grown, lukewarm and shameless, no desire for Christian labor. No desire for the deeper things of God. No desire to be the light or to even spread the light. The church come in like Charles Barkley who said, I'm not a role model. Just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. Well, by default, church, you are a role model. We are a role model because we are the light of the world. We are light to a darkened world. Rather than us going out and lighting the world, lighting our present darkness, we're content to stay in the shadows. There's no other plan. God has no other plan. You are it. I am it. Our families are, we Christians are the plan, God's plan. There's no other plan for God to light the world except through us, through our testimony. We are saved to work. We're saved to save others. Look at what Jesus told his disciples when they asked about a man who was born blind. In John chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The bottom line that I want you to get out of this is verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. See, night is the absence of the sun in the sky above. In other words, night is the absence of the dominant light. There is still the moon. There's still the stars. They still shine their light upon the earth. But darkness is the dominating force that prevails over the earth at night. The night will come we, when we Christians begin to take the light, 
that is within us and hide it under a bushel instead of placing it on a lampstand so that it might light the whole house. Therefore, when the oppressive darkness of night comes, the Christians, us Christians, the light of the world, we will hide our light instead of sharing it with the world. See, it's happening today. We can't tell one Christian from another. We, Christians look the same as non-Christians. The believers look the same as non-believers. We look alike. We talk alike. We act alike. And neither one of us are emitting light. Oh, but Brother Kenny, somebody would say. Jesus said that he was the light of the world. True. But only as long as he was in the world, then we, his representatives, would carry the light to the world. Look at John chapter 9, verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. See, once Jesus was taken up into heaven, we became the light to the world. Now we are to reflect Jesus' light, to guide the unbeliever out of darkness and into that light. Not for us to join the darkness or try to look like the darkness. How can darkness reflect light? Christians want to be all tatted up. They want to be looking like the world in order to win the world. They dress any old how to come to worship. Again, looking like the world. We, we go to worship with torn up jeans and, uh, and barefoot and shorts and torn up t-shirts and just to make somebody else feel comfortable. Make them feel acceptable. It is not about feeling comfortable. It's about shining your light in the, in the world, shining your light in order for the unbeliever to see your good works and let God's conviction consume the unbeliever, bringing a sense of need for repentance upon that unbeliever that he might receive Jesus Christ and thus receive life. It is not about feeling comfortable. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, when we shine our light, it exposes darkness that's within others who are around us. The light of Jesus will reveal true motives, the true heart. It will reveal the true condition of the soul. It will show the self for who it truly is. And that is where the trouble begins for the Christian who insists on shining their light. What am, what am I talking about? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Paul said, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal processions, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ of, to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. You see, not everyone is going to accept our message of life. Not everyone is going to accept or tolerate the pain of being cut in their souls when the spotlight of Jesus begins to shine its piercing light into the never-before-seen crevices of the darkness that hides within. But nonetheless, we are to let our light so shine that we can do as Jude instructed us in Jude 23. It says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. But instead of snatching the poor soul out of the fire, we are content to watch them burn. How lukewarm 
the church has become. I read a story about a missionary who went out to reach a tribe in North Senatal Island, a place so remote that the natives still shoot arrows at the helicopters trying to leave them supplies. Even the government does not interfere with them. Anyway, his desire was to reach that tribe with the eternal gospel of Christ. Unfortunately, he was shot by the tribe using bow and arrows, killing him. His body was unable to be retrieved by the authorities. His father, as well as other Christians, including a pastor friend, blamed Western, Western ideology and evangelical culture for John Charles' death, calling it extreme Christianity. They feel embittered against the evangelical practice of adhering to the Great Commission instituted by Jesus, commanding us to go into all the world and preach the good news, preach the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus also warns us that some will be thrown into prison, others will be killed, and most of us will be persecuted when we go out and try to do this uh, this great commission, try to win the loss, because for some, we will be the fragrance from death to death. But you see this young man, John Chow, he held to what Jesus promised in Mark chapter 8, verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. I want to share some posts that was posted after this young man was, was killed. I want to read two. It says, and I quote, Of course, I feel sorry and saddened for him and his family, but I can't understand these missionaries who decide that their faith is superior to others and they must try to convert others to save them. I really resent this. I would never try to impose my own faith on anyone. Nor would I target a young person and try to take them away from the faith their parents raised them in. We are the fragrance to some, from death to death. We leave a nasty smell in their nostrils. Because they do not know Jesus. They do not love the Lord. Here's another post. And I quote, John Allen Chow is not a martyr, just a dumb American who thought the tribals needed Jesus when the tribals already live in harmony with God and nature for years without outside interference. End of quote. Well, I want to inform you. John Allen Chow is a martyr. And he will receive a martyr's reward. You see, if we truly believe what we say we believe, which is that one day every single soul will stand before the Lord God Almighty and be judged. Those who have rejected Jesus will be sentenced to an eternity in a burning lake of fire, which is a horrific and dreadful punishment for all eternity. If we truly, if we really and truly believe that, then we would spare no effort. We would spare no expense to get these people saved, just like John Chow did. That is the true test of true love. For without Jesus, souls will perish. And John Chow knew that. Without Jesus, 
those tribals, those tribal people would be lost. And he wanted to bring them life, even if it cost him his own life. He is a martyr. Matter of fact, he is a hero. And if we, without the gospel, for some people, even if they don't want to hear it, we must still bring this, the gospel of Jesus. We must still tell. But we cannot withhold the gospel because of fear of ridicule. We shouldn't even withhold the gospel for fear of death. Why? Because their blood will then be on our hands, according to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18. I want to say again, if we honestly believe in eternal punishment and a burning lake of fire where the flames are not quenched, then we must do everything we can to save some. Not everyone will come to Jesus. No, we understand that. Not everyone will accept it. Not even everyone will be even pleased about it. Some will be hateful towards it. Some will try to kill us. They'll throw us in prison. But we must be a shining light to a lost and dying world. And you know what? From his letters, John Chow understood that. Because that's exactly what he was trying to do. He was trying to be light to those people living in darkness. Those people who took his life. And he knew the rest. He didn't go in there naively. He didn't go in there pompously. He didn't go in there without forethought. He planned this for years. Listen to what he wrote to his parents just before he was killed. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. This is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand. And I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language as Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 10 states. I love you all, and I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. End of quote. John Chow was being light to a lost and dying world. And instead of us seeing his good work and glorifying his Father who is in heaven, we ridicule him. We call him all kinds of names. He believed that everyone will stand before Jesus to be sentenced for all eternity. He, was, he so believed that, that he was willing to lay down his life for it, if it came down to that. And you know what? That moment for Jesus' return is closer now than when we first began. Everything is boiling down to that moment, the time of Jesus' return. And you know what? His rewards are with him for the good and for the bad. Whatever we have done in this life, we will be rewarded for. So whatever we're going to do for Jesus and for the kingdom of God, we had better do it now. For the plans of the enemy are almost all in place now. That time of great tribulation that's coming upon the earth is really close now. So whether you believe it or whether you don't, whether you think it's conspiracy or not. Whether you want to be a part of it or just be a bystander, it will all come to pass just as it is written. And that's why Paul wrote this to the Romans. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. 
For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You see, we do not walk in darkness, neither do we fumble around without the light. Because Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We have the light of life because we have Jesus. And if we have the light of life, then we must share that light. Let your light so shine, Jesus said. Remember, the night will come when we hide the light of Jesus that's within us. We will put it under a basket. We will hide it under a bushel instead of sharing it with the world. Because the world will oppress the word of God. The world's darkness will crush out the light of Jesus because of this great tribulation that is coming upon the world. When the night comes, then no man will be able to work the good works of him who has called us to be the light to the world. So let me ask you, are you a light carrier or are you a bystander? Have you received the light of Jesus that brings life? If you have not, but you would like to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and thus receive life, eternal life, it's free. It will cost you absolutely nothing. Jesus paid that full price for you and he paid the full price for me. So that we might have access to life. It is not his will that any should perish. Therefore, he gave his own life that we might live. Would you like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Here's how you do it. All you got to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Believe in your heart that Jesus has heard and that he has received and that he has forgiven you. Because if you ask, he will. Repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to be the light that you've called me to be. Help me to shine this light in my present darkness. That I might light my small corner of the world. Thank you for giving your life, Jesus that I might have life. I accept it now. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible and I can't tell you how important it is for you to be in the Word, to learn the Word, to study the Word, to memorize the Word. Hide it away in your heart that you might not sin against them. Then find a Bible-believing church who still believes in the power of Almighty God, who still believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, who still believes in holiness and in righteousness. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of of the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you and we love you. The Lord bless you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.